Thank you very much for showing up at this late hour. Um, the good news is there won't be any code anymore today, but rather some, I don't know, it's definitely different from what you probably saw the rest of the days. I don't know if, if you even can make sense out of it because I, I'm not sure if I can. So yeah, I will show you today about, uh, well, talk about finding dragons. Let's uh, quickly, because you might not know me, my name is Mario Klingemann and I call myself a code artist, which means, um, well, my cell is like I create beautiful things with code. So, well, as you will see, not all, uh, all of them are truly beautiful, but uh, they might be strange or uh, might not even be visuals. But yes, so I've been doing this quite some time and I guess I will sit down now because I always have to go up and down here. So, um, well, as you also might have noticed, um, I'm not that young anymore. I'm, I've been doing that for 20 years and I just recently checked uh, the newspaper. There was an article and that said uh, that the average age in Germany now is at 44.9, which puts me just at the edge because like I'm just got 44. And probably if I would live in Italy, I would already have to go for retirement because I think here the age difference is probably like 35 or so. So, well, and as with age comes a certain kind of like uh, grumpiness and like I've seen it all and something like that. So uh, there's a little video I want to show you that, some, that shows a little bit like uh, how I sometimes feel in, in this kind of world of selfies and uh, everybody sharing everything and uh, it's all about like likes and things. So the, the, the one thing is I just learned that there's no audio output so I hope this sound will work for playing from the microphone. So this is from a 2005 British series called Nathan Barley. Do I have to do something? <laughs> okay, I almost switched the off button. This will be interesting, I think. I think it actually hit F5, so should we do it one more time, but then I guess skip it, I guess. Well, in the end, okay, let's just skip it. So this guy is a grumpy old man who looks around, sees hipsters and guys that do share shit on Twitter, and yeah, in a way, it's sometimes that feels like, oh my god, that's me. So. There comes the time when then I think like, damn, why I am doing this, what I'm doing now, and uh, and still keep on doing this, like doing, creating things with code and stuff. And uh, well, I don't know why you guys are doing what you're doing. You might be in it for the money you earn, or because you want to make the world a better place. But I am in it for purely egoistic purposes, and that is because I'm somehow addicted to the joy that finding something creates in me. So when I working on a project and I stuck onto something interesting in a way that gives me almost like a, like an endorphin kick or so. Other people might be addicted to running and jogging or you might be addicted to chocolate. And for me, it's this kind of feeling like stuck striking on something, first the search and then finding, which always and again and again gives me the kick. And of course, there are different types of finding. So there is like uh, finding patterns, like uh, you look at something and then you suddenly recognize something and say, oh, now that looks interesting and I just discovered this, like almost like kind of an coming from back from evolution when you had to spot the tiger in hiding in the bushes or when you were looking for food and you, then you see a berry there and you see, oh, food. Obviously, finding matches, so I love doing jigsaw puzzles and like uh, that feeling when you find the, the missing piece that just fits in there. Again, it's actually giving me like an uh, organic feeling that I really like. Finding the solution to a problem obviously is always great and finding out new things, learning, like learning new techniques, learning something. Again, it's all in this kind of finding realm. Um, well, now you might wonder what does this have to do with finding dragons? So let's go back 500 years in the world where maps looked like this and there were actually on this globe an area that says Hickson Draconis, like here be dragons. So this was a world which was not really fully explored yet. There were wide areas 
and you actually had the chance, or people were still actually believing that there might be some dragons, some mythical creatures hidden somewhere in an unexplored area of the world. And obviously, we don't live in these times anymore. So this, that was the age of the explorer, where you could really still go out and physically find something new. Now, I don't know, it seems like, well, now it's really about liking and uh, like sharing yourself. But, and I somehow have the hope still to, in a way, in what I'm doing, uh, to eventually, I mean, and so far I haven't succeeded, to find really something that, well, surprises me, surprises others, and is somehow unseen. So, and that's for me, in a way, the dragon that I'm constantly looking for. Of course, in my field of creating visuals, building myself tools that allow me then to in, in helping in this search. So, this is what I'm after. Oh yeah, so there's one dragon here, which, okay, I plug this now because we might ask later. These were especially made for me by my girlfriend, made out of paper. So they are not 3D rendered, so they are physical objects that are actually on my table. And so, okay, so the first project, which somehow gets close to what I, like this kind of search for, or the, that allows me to find actually unseen things, started with the British Library. And they, like, Actually, and then Microsoft was also involved. Microsoft once, like a few years ago, digitized about 30,000 or 50,000, I don't know, I'm not quite sure, old books from 500 years ago to like the, the late, uh, the early 20th century. So they digitized all these books in order to digitize all the texts in there to do OCR. So though the contents could be searched and things. And the interesting thing that, that happened is that one guy that works at the digital department of the British Library, he looked at the OCR data that well, Microsoft had retrieved, and there were lots of these areas where it says no text, no text, no discernible text. And it always also come out, somehow delineated an area where it said like, okay, this area, I don't find any text. So he, looked, he wrote a little program which then looked again at those original scans and figured out that all these areas which had no text had actually graphics and uh, illustrations and diagrams. So he wrote a program called the Mechanical Curator and that took again all these scans which are really high res and automatically uploads them to Flickr. And what the British Library did then now uh, did then is to like, put one million of these images stemming from 500 years ago to like 100 years ago in the, in the public domain. So there are now one million images that you can use for free, which are, is like a huge variety of content. I mean, it's all books, but it's beautiful things that people have spent lots of time creating, actually. So, unfortunately, the screen is relatively small, but as you can maybe see, so there's lots of portraits, architectural drawings. Um, this one is a little bit bigger, oh no. And then there are lots of decorative elements. Um, here's a bigger one. And it's really high res. And, well, the only problem with this is, so, because a machine actually scanned this data, no human has looked at it yet. I mean, the, when, if you go to the Flickr site and browse through the stream, you might be the first one who had looked at this image since like, uh, that book was originally printed. So that is the interesting part for me now. So it's really like a treasure hunt because you can even see like, how many people have viewed this image on Flickr and sometimes it has a one, which means you are the first one who to rediscover this image. But the problem with this is, so you have one million images and they are not tagged at all. The only information that's available is that they come from this book and that book was released in 1700 something and it by this author. But you have no idea what is actually on that image. And that is where, well, I got somehow, I felt challenged to do something about it. And so, my, ta my goal was to figure out a way to, like, to write my own kind of image classification engine which where I first analyze the images and then tell the algorithm, okay, on this bunch of pictures you have uh, lots of portraits you, and this contains just initials and this contains decorative elements. And well, the way to go about this is obviously first you have to translate an image into a long chain of numbers. So 
What you do is you run several classifiers over it. You analyze, an image contains lots of information about its structure, edges, its distribution of grayscale values, certain features, lines, and stuff. So, and you can turn every, every uh, one of these features into a number or a group of numbers and combine them into what is called a, a vector. So in 3D, you can imagine, like, you measure three values. Um, let's say, well, let's, let's, you know, everybody probably knows the RGB color scheme. Uh, so you have one component red, one green, one blue, and then you can map that in a 3D space. And you can imagine doing the same with images. Just you don't measure just colors, but you measure, let's say, how curvy something is, or how many, how the ratio between very chaotic areas and very, very smooth areas is. So what you do is you actually can kind of map this image in a multi-dimensional space. And when you do this with a lot of images you get clusters. So certain images of a certain type will cluster in this area, and then others, like in a virtual 100-dimensional room, and others will cluster there. And I'm simplifying this. But in a way, this is how what actually happens. And then there are tools that actually help you finding these clusters. So, okay, first step, I analyze the images, put them into a vector, and then I had to learn something new, which is R, and so R is a language which is specialized in, like, data mining, and uh, it's actually making uh, this very, very easy, because, well, you have all, like, in data mining, you have lots of tools, like statistical tools and classifiers and things, which, well, I'm not a scientist, so, but I, I'm browsing, I'm Googling, and then I find something which is called a support vector machine or a random forest. And, well, for, at first I have no idea, but you somehow start getting an idea. But then there's the question, okay, now do I implement this whole thing myself in JavaScript or in Java or do I use R, where all I have to use then is one line to load my data and the second line that actually runs then a training set or a support vector machine on this. So actually what you, and the R is, has, is really open source and is really easy accessible. There are even some, a tool that I love to use, it's called Rattle, and that is giving you even a, a GUI where you can then just click buttons and say, I want to load this, I want to use this classifier, and in the end it outputs you this bunch of code. And then you learn along it and say, okay, I tweak here. But okay, so in the end, all I had to do is pay, take R, use my classifiers, and then train some images. And then this is what I'm getting, for example. So here, you already see it's just containing these decorative elements, for example, or just initials. So these are all these big letters which start in the upper corner, or mathematical diagrams. So as you can see, they have already, I mean, they, these images definitely have certain properties which differentiate them from the others. So this one is very compact, the previous one. This has lots of thin lines. So that makes it very easy for the algorithm to split this up. Um, handwritten notes, uh, musical notes, uh, that one is the easiest somehow. It, that's because there's always the problem, you never, when, when you do this, especially if you do it as naive as I do it, you never get a 100% hit rate. So if you're getting like 90%, you're already good, and 95 is probably the best, like out of 100 pictures, if five are wrongly classified, you're already doing good. So, and I'm not yet there. Well, so for me, it, but it's already like I have a big chunk of muck. You could see, see this like gold digging. So there's a lot of dirt, and I can already split it up into much smaller heaps, and then in the end, manually sieve through it and say, okay, this is the little nugget that I want. So this is really, well, it's fun to watch this happening. Like, it's really like you have a rough sieve and then it trickles down and you get more and more information out there. So these are, for example, all kind of circular objects I found and collections of objects. And this is beautiful stuff. I mean, that's, that's what I would think, like, people must have spent thousands of hours in manually carving out these things, and now they are just getting lost somewhere in a library, that, in a book that nobody ever picks up. And so maybe take them, learn something, use them for other things. I, I find that really, well, because it's, it, lots, of, lots of the things are much better than uh, some things that are created now. I mean, 
Okay, they look old school, but I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm nostalgic as you like. And obviously, there are lots of color pictures and beautiful animal uh, illustrations and things that you might be using for, well, well whatever, wh whatever comes to your mind. Tons of maps and, uh, oh, portraits, obviously, like of, uh, if you need some inspiration for your latest hipster beard style, you definitely have like a, a treasure box there where you, well, lo find lots of beards that you might have never seen. And oh, these are like what I call the diamonds. So this is this uh, a special kind of paper technique um, which was used for creating the, the covers of the books or in the internal si pages. So they are all manually created. And so this is like when you have this uh, 10,000 pictures and you search through them, there's like one or two in 10,000 of these. And whenever I find one of those, I think so far I found maybe like 40, then I'm always happy and uh, obviously what happens then, I tag this stuff on Flickr so you don't have to. So then you can actually, so adding this information then helps to actually others to, to make use of it. Well, I make use of it too then, so, well, sometimes uh, this, for example, is like taking, like combining like an old style, old illustration with some very filthy manga comic, uh, which where I really had to go to sites that I better not mention. So I have, nobody could, well, has translated this yet for me, but uh, I think it's very filthy. So then we have for example like i like putting things in order so what we see here i hope you can see it it's like 16 very sad girls i found so they are all crying or uh, 36 anonymous profiles so these are all geo geological profiles i found it really nice to arrange them this way or colored portraits and maybe you can see that but i used some face detection on them and now though every like they are all looking to the inside so this face detection thing can recognize like the tilt of your head and so i try to then sort them by where they are looking and here's the same thing with i think uh, a thousand or so and again they are all rotating their head and again like i mentioned my age land one last time but this is what i built for myself so there is this face detection that can also estimate the age of a person on a on a picture so i asked him give me all men that look like 44 and this is what i got and again i sorted them this way so oh yeah well but uh, in this my attempt to try to find new things and uh, thinking that I have created something new. It sometimes happened that I have to, to eat a big bunch of humble pie and something like that happened I think a year ago when there was a project called uh, Recode, the Recode project. And what they did, they found some old kind of university magazine called Computer Graphics and Art from 1976. And that was in a way the, well, it was, well, before internet, it was the way computer graphic, like computer artists were exchanging ideas back in the 70s. And it was pretty like, I mean, well, see for yourself what they did back then and then compare it what we are doing now. And so what I see there is like, oh my God, they had the same ideas like, uh, like I still see coming up on my Tumblr feed, now, feed nowadays. So yes, so take a picture and vary the thickness of a font over it. Or, yeah, pixel art. This is from 1976, pixel art. Or glitch stuff. I mean, this one, I really like it, but it's damn. So you think, my God, I have created a new look, and in the end, it has been done before, or this is some kind of curtain, and this looks very much like stuff I will show to you later. And, oh yeah, my favorite, this guy actually signed a Voronoi diagram, and uh, this is very popular. I mean, the Voronoi is kind of the hello world of uh, generative art. Everybody has to have done it, and yes, I'm guilty also myself. So this is something like I, I did for Christmas where I... So it's in the end, it's a Voronoi diagram with a slight twist, but yeah, so turned them into animated GIFs. 
And uh, yeah, well, when I did it, I thought, oh yeah, well, actually, when I did that, I already had something like a bad feeling of using the Voronoi, but maybe that's more like an insider thing. But yeah, it's one of the forbidden algorithms that you should never use without making at least a few changes to it. And another one. So, and there is this thing, yeah, so I'm, I'm in conflict, as you see. So here is a, a quote by Paul Graham from Hackers and Painters, and it goes over and over, we see the same pattern, a new medium appears, and people are so excited about it that they explore most of its possibilities in the first couple of generations. And so, yeah, computers to create art have been out there since the 60s or so, and yes, there's the thing, it's... People are creating lots of lots of new things, but are they really new or are they just like reiterations of ideas that others have had before? So, but yeah, I don't have any answers what, what or solutions or, well, I'm trying, but uh, it's really tough to go out and try to create something new. And yes, so you might say, okay, I just stand on the shoulders of giants and make little steps to improve, or like to go to somewhere, something new. But yeah, I still have the illusion I write a tool and it creates something totally new. But yeah, it's probably an illusion. So another dragon. So now this, oh, no, we are still not at the audio part, but that will be interesting. So here's a little thing. Well, that is really super simple, but I'm also part of a startup. So all the generative art I'm doing is really mostly for my personal amusement. But uh, so as, as a startup, you sometimes have the problem that you want to come up with a new name for something you just built. And if you ever done that, it's a horrible experience because everybody has ideas and hates the other people's ideas. And uh, while well, you think you have the best name and then well, nobody appreciates it. And so it goes on and on. So I thought like, oh, why don't I write a program that gives me names? So I feed in a certain style and then it outputs me things that sound like the, loud, like the content that I've put in there. So it's actually a very simple principle. It uses Markov chains, so-called, and what it does is analyzes a body of text and looks at like, neighboring letters, in a way, and then it builds kind of a uh, probability table and says, okay, if there's an A, there's a 20% chance that it will be followed by a D and like a 15% chance that it followed by this letter. And so it does these random jumps and for every, and you can do that with one letters or several letters combinations. And before I keep on talking, let's just see what it does. So first one uses, so I fed in an English dictionary. And so this is not actually giving, this is just generating random words which are sounding English but are, Totally, well, some of them might actually be in a dictionary, and, uh, but some of them are not. But English is not so much fun. That's why for you guys I made one, because I built one with German, and I found it actually quite funny sometimes. So I don't know if this works in Italian, so you must tell me. So I built one that tries to generate words that sound Italian. So. There we go. So just uh, tell me if it means anything. <laughs> oh, see? Okay, well, it, it worked already in Holland. And uh, is that a real word? I mean, so actually what I did, uh, so I just let it run for, and some of them might even be filthy. <laughs> so some, is that good? Okay, so it might be. Okay, it seems to work. Uh, I, so, okay, I mean, I don't know if I... <laughs> okay, well... <laughs> and I don't even get the joke. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so the other thing, what I did, so yeah, as you can see, I can feed in some kind of content and it will try to generate something else. So what I did, I fed in band names because I guess that's also very popular. You come up with a band. So... Let's see. So this, some of them are boring. Okay, so Steel Shock. Mm. <laughs> well, it's pretty much a hipster band. I don't know. A tennis <laughs> sounds like Blur or so. I'd say, not bad. So <laughs> Planese. Well, it could be an Italian. I don't know. Adams. Okay, some of them are really normal stuff. And uh, 
could be a boy group maybe. Uh, that is good, Lucillers. I don't know, but yeah, you, you get the idea. So it's, uh, it's going on and on and on and on. So I can do lots of them. And what I did is, of course, I wanted to also find words that have never been found, at least not on Google. So I combined this, like whenever it creates a word, it does a Google search. And uh, if there is zero results, then I create the world and automatically upload it to a Tumblr feed. So in a way, I'm setting my flag and they're saying, ha ha, I'm the first one to ever use the word anchifying, whatever that means. But yeah, so and uh, I'm thinking of maybe doing an app actually, which is helpful because then you could uh, put in like start a or epi sounding names. And because, yeah, you're running out of things like Twitter and I don't know. Well, throw me like something with lots of O's or Y's and things. So yeah, that's that might be coming. So or I just put up the algorithm because it's really simple. There is uh, not much. But yeah, it's having fun. So OK, I might have to skip this very quickly if the sound sounds ugly. But we come to another thing I played with also not just with visuals, but also with sound. And again, the original idea did not even come from me, but from the demo scene. And there was this, this guy called Wisnat. I have no idea what his real name is, but uh, he put up this idea that you can create 8-bit sounds, like this classic game sound, by from, from a single line of code. Well, that line can be rather long, but so you write one line of code, and that has only one variable, which is like time, so it's a T. And then, depending on what you, how you structure that function, it generates some interesting or weird sounding sounds. So what I did, I built, my little, uh, built me a little flash tool with a visualization, but uh, that because it's... Okay, so here's the sound. So I don't know if you can see that, but this is the single line of code that creates this sound. And yes, it's... And because I'm lazy and I like being surprised, I have a way that, that it generates me new random formulas. And people who liked that fire alarm before, they might appreciate what comes now. Because uh, I can't tell you what if it's good or bad. OK, bad. Bad. Ah! So. It's actually almost okay, so I can even like I can go and change some of the variables here. Ah, okay, let's try another one. But so there's the hope that one day it will output me something really nice. So, and then there are certain patterns reoccurring. It's like, uh, there's like a Pascal triangle which is hidden in the music constantly. So, there's rhythm. But yeah, it's an acquired taste. It's, uh, but it's really, so this, it's a single line of code, but okay, let's uh, close this and, uh, yes. It's very possible, and <laughs> yeah, that might maybe that's a means of communication. Yeah, maybe they, if they are into the same weird stuff. Yes. Oh, and I skipped just now. So, and okay, because it's I like just. <coughs> Being able to randomize it was, was maybe like after a while, you find something which might be interesting, but then you want to like vary it a little bit. I went and uh, used the new kind of audio capabilities of, of JavaScript and wrote me a little editor, which allows me then to live code what's going on in here. So I can actually now go ahead and And let's use another one. And you can get ugly stuff too, so... 
So, but of course you can also just enter something like a, a mass function in there. Well, that will probably... Well, actually this should, should produce something. Well, I don't know. Okay, let's just input in a T. Well, I won't bore you with code. Okay, so, but you can see, so this is interesting exploration tool to, to and if you want to have a game with an, a soundtrack which just uh, doesn't use any memory, you could try that. But yeah, I have been babbling and actually I think I'm, I should move on. Because you can take the same concept, which like this single formula thing also to create visuals again. So in a way, actually you saw that already before where I mapped that on a circle. And then I thought, well, why not use, uh, like see what, what I can do and uh, outputting these mathematical kind of formulas and see randomize, oh, lots of glitchy stuff. And okay, well, this might be interesting, but yeah, not much in it. So let's try another formula. And we always hope that sometimes something might come up. Okay, well, no. So actually, most of the time, I'm just saying no, 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 no. Okay, maybe in color. How about that? Oops. So maybe here. Uh, well, okay, on its own, this is uh, an interesting uh, kind of, uh, how you call it, attempt, but again, it might be an acquired taste. And we were talking about, oh, that's why I was wondering. So, ah, great, because, well, because of the web, I, today, usually I show this in Firefox, and there I get tabs, but Chrome seems to have a weird kind of uh, full screen mode. So I have to restart my thing because it ate up my, my tab. So, and because I just noticed that the audio thing stopped working in, uh, in Firefox because it was using the deprecated API so, so much. But we are almost there. Ah, okay. So. What I did then, so I have this little module which creates me interesting visuals or somewhat interesting visuals, and, but well, it needs a little bit of help. So I built me another little tool which now takes, I can take an image, okay, let's start with the beard man. And now what you can see here, which you can't really see up there, it now uses these little random formulas to create a single tile and then tries to find the best place to match this tile with the image and replace it and rebuild this image on the left using just these generated formulas. So let's try it in... Uh, and if you let this run long enough, it, so it, whenever it finds, so it's really simple. So it takes a tile, goes through this left image, and compares them. And if that match is closer to what is already there, then it will re replace it everywhere it finds it. And uh, once you do this long enough, you, well, you can see it already starts slightly improving. Then you get stuff like a noisy Mona Lisa, or a selfie of me, uh, but in this kind of glitchy look, which, well, well I find that quite, like, I don't know. I'm, as you see, I'm, I'm a bit lazy. I probably could do this manually, but it's so much more fun if the machine does it for you. And uh, so, another tool. So, I'm, as you see, I'm building tool over tool, which where I'm trying at one point to always get surprised. So, Sketchmaker is a long-term project of mine. I call it the blind Sketchmaker, and it's about the idea that the computer can actually generate images which somehow look like art. And uh, so, it's a combination of a genetic system which recombines certain little, let's say, sub-machines that every every little agent has a certain purpose, like one draws circles, the other one blurs the image. Imagine it like Photoshop actions, but only that it's driven by one million monkeys that randomly press the buttons. And so in order to get something like a better result, I combine that with image analysis, where the machine looks at the image it has created and tries to find out if that is something that I have told it previously I might like. So let's... And there's an automatic version, which 
it's so so and then there's the manual evolution version and that looks like this and yes we have the 1024 thing which is not so great but it will work so as you can see so I c again I click and it generates me a random gene of things and now it I can let it grow and this is we need a little bit more here so let's do less variations and um, mix okay so and now I can have this thing do me variations of what I have here and say okay I want to go this way oh that was not good let's, let's go with new And again, if you do this long enough, at one point you are actually getting something that is a little bit more interesting. So I start, can we see this? So this is like one evolution series. So whenever, like every image has somehow evolved out of a previous one. And uh, well, again, acquired taste, but uh, some of them are at least something I would not manually do and yes, yeah, some of them sometimes I just save it just to document the kind of flow. That was, I think that's that's I like quite that's weird. Hmm, oh, too simple. Okay, here we go. Something I there's a guy there, he's hanging on to some car. <laughs> now you can see him better. Oh. This one is quite, oh, this one is, you don't see it, okay? So it has some kind of tribal feel to it, I think. And uh, let's have a look at the other series. Okay, this is a simpler one. Glitchy. Well, this one actually like African mask style. So yeah. And the one thing I once did is then, because it's pixels, I took a bunch of them and had them sent to China and painted again on canvas in oil, because uh, that makes it more important somehow and, and more fun. Um, and what I can also do is, uh, so I can just take the dirty output of, the, of this glitchy thing and combine it with a collage engine, where in a way it's similar to what I've shown you before, I take parts and in a, instead of using square tiles, I'm actually trying to match parts to more organic parts of, uh, of the image. But I'm just using these glitchy tiles. So again, kind of a new look, maybe. So another dragon. Um, inspiration. So maybe also a topic. So where do we get inspiration from? And again, I always think, so this room, this, let's say this realm of ideas is somehow like, uh, like nature. So, and monoculture is usually not so good. So if you only look in your own little field, like what you're already doing for inspiration, then it might be, uh, well, that some of the more interesting ideas might lie somewhere else. So, well, I couldn't say that mathematics is not really my field, but so, well, I f usually follow, like, I like Quora a lot because then I follow lots of people with questions and uh, sometimes there's an interesting question asked and that gives me something like an idea. So there was one where somebody was asking, how would, uh, like, how long would it take until uh, a ray of light in a triangle of mirrors would reflect back on itself? So I found that question to be interesting and built me a little script to to try out when that actually happens and um, is that and that is not here anymore or okay uh, yeah of course here <laughs> so um, what you have here is a polygon and a light ray and uh, you can start this and because and down here, you see then uh, an accumulator that like accumulates all the light rays that bounce around in this in this polygon 
because if you draw it like this, you would just get something like a, a black kind of uh, blob. So you don't want that. So if we let this accumulate for a while, we are getting these kind of patterns that somehow look like quantum or I don't know what. But so it's, let's see what happens here. And if you do this long enough, then uh, this is how it works. So then we get results like some interesting kind of weird mesmerizing patterns, for example. This is probably too dark to see, but well, if you want to check it out later. And here, ah, this one is, I don't know, can you see these weird reflecting lines that are bouncing around? Find that quite nice. Okay, another, oops, uh, another tool I like to use is tiling. Again, you saw that, like cutting things up into pieces and uh, putting them back together. And uh, so this started by these guys next to me opening up a cafe. And uh, what they did, they had a logo which was just like uh, some triangles. And I thought, uh, I show you, let's use um, Lena first. So what they, well, what you have is triangles. And uh, well, actually like, yeah, a square which is cut in the middle. And uh, well, how many ways can you combine them to, uh, to form an image? So, well, again, I was too lazy. So I wanted to, I didn't want to, to put that up manually. So I wrote me this tool which I can put in a photo and it will put, try to put those tiles in the position where they match the underlying photo best. And you can increase the resolution and uh, try this out with another image. Let's use, for example, her. And you get these nearly like abstract versions of your, yeah, this one is, and if you allow subject, but okay, so it's the simple version. So uh, I thought like, well, why not use uh, this in different layers and uh, stack them on top? So how about using this guy? And again, so it renders this guy in different layers and then you can recombine them uh, using like a CMYK model. And here I can uh, somehow try out random colors and, and give me some interesting arrangements and maybe try this again with my logo. Or, well, I never tried it with a bird, so no idea what happens if I do that. Well, it's getting pretty abstract with the bird. Maybe I have to reduce the resolution. But so you can, uh, well, again, it's helping me to Stike, maybe strike on stuff which, and so for example, here you have the, the dancer again in a bit of a dirty fashion, or this lady, and I actually like that quite. Or here is a, a bird uh, ran, visited by a dog. I don't know, see the dog, the little birdie up there? So, <laughs> quite nice. Um, so then uh, you can take this tiling concept a little bit further and uh, there's a thing called Vang tiles. And the way it works, like before you had the triangle and you could just put it everywhere. But imagine you have tiles which are your own, uh, you are only allowed to put together in a certain way if their edges match. So like this. So on the right side I have a tile set. So there are different types of tiles, like a full square, a, a full wide square, then half circles, and the negative version of it. And then you can write a program that tells you, OK, that, that only allows to put black edges on black edges, and white edges and white edges. And when you do that, you can randomly create these patterns, which usually do not repeat. And uh, well. Are, might, you might be want to use them for your next bathroom tiling or so, or wallpaper. But yeah, so this is a pretty explored concept. So I thought like, okay, what if I can create a bigger set of, of these tile sets by feeding in typography and chopping those letters up and uh, building a, a new kind of set. 
and I hope we see something. Okay, yeah, in a way you can see this. So what I'm doing, I'm taking letters, which have nice shapes, and putting them in a grid and chopping them up. And uh, well, then again, I'm using the same rule, not, not exactly, because chopping them up this way will not always give you a perfect match. So I'm allowing for a little bit of a tolerance. And uh, you might be seeing where this is going, so it tries to create new kinds of shapes. So the, the problem is now to just uh, cut the letters at the right spots or find the right rules. But I still think, for example, this one is then creating me this kind of uh, yeah weird alien font again. So we could use that for the aliens maybe. Or it generates me, for example, this kind of uh, hybrid between a one and a two, which smirks. So again, I recombining things. I, I don't know. Maybe somebody want to use this for a one-two startup or so. I don't know. <laughs> one-two, and I don't know how you could combine the three in there. And I don't know how I'm doing with my. Oh, 50 minutes. Okay. Well, I'm going fast, but. Uh, yeah, so I don't know, I've said that before, I'm, I'm coming from the Flash world, or, right? I have a big Flash background, but yes, that is over now, but, uh, or like we have moved on, but there's one thing you could do in Flash, which you still not really can do well in, in JavaScript or Canvas, and that is the shape tween. <laughs> so morphing one shape into another. And uh, I recently had the, the problem or the, the task that I had to morph 99 uh, illustrations in one into another. And uh, because I didn't want to do that manually, so I thought like maybe there's a way to like actually uh, for once help JavaScript to finally get this, also the ability to morph, sh morph vectors into each other and just because of the fun of finding out if it works. So I found a paper which actually has a, a pretty nice way of figuring it out, the morphs between two vectors, which is actually not that easy as it sounds, because there's the naive way, and if you Google it now, you will figure out like, oh, this tool can do it, but you cannot just take one point here and here and then blend one to the other. That will give you weird stuff in the middle. So you actually have to something find out something about the structure of the polygon itself. So, where is it? Shape tween, here we go. So, I have wrote this little program so I can draw some kind of weird shape, and that is too weird, so one and another one, and now it will calculate me the tween and go do 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 So, this is, and it works most of the time, as as usual, but yeah, so, and uh, this is really, so what it does is, I think, uh, so it actually, what it does is it uses these kind of multi-resolution polygons. So it's splitting up, it's, it's subdividing the, this polygon into s more and more abstract kind of forms, and these can then be blended one into each other, and they can get more complex and more complex, and uh, in the end, so it's a very interesting paper, and I should have put up the link, and uh, if you want to know the paper or you just want to have the code, then you can contact me later. And so I wanted to show you also this little thing with, actually, with the, the bowls. It's not fully perfect yet, because there is always the problem, like, as long as you have one shape, like one outline to another, it's easy, but then if you have an outline in another outline, which is somehow depending on that shape, there it gets a little bit trickier, but uh, so um, you might be able to, so I can, this is the debug mode, and so I can play these guys, and uh, as you can see, it's doing quite a good job there. So it's these 99 bowls, and I had to do some manual tweaking with the outlines afterwards, but to do this all manually would have been quite a drag. And so, yeah, I will soon release this uh, as something like you can reuse in your favorite geometry tool, because, yeah, everybody needs a morph. And uh, actually, 
I think that's it for now. But if you have questions, I gladly answer or show you more stuff that I haven't shown yet. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, the, the German words. Uh, yeah. I think I had, uh, I had to pre-compile it because, and I didn't put it in. I can show you the Dutch one, I think. Uh, anybody speak Dutch? No, probably it's not that fun then. Uh, name finder. Mm, no. I can show it to you later when I run it from my compiler. Then I can put in the German. Yeah, it's also pretty interesting. So, sorry for that. <laughs> Yes. Oh. Can you describe your job? I mean, what my do you job. Do? Okay. So, well, there are two things. So, my job, my actual job now is I work. I'm like a partner at a startup called Psychosoft, where we're building creative tools. So, in a way, stuff that I'm doing here is part of what I'm like also doing for apps, for example. I don't know. So one of the tools we build is a painting app, which allows people who are even not talented to paint to create beautiful output. So my job is to turn the stroke into something crazy or something interesting. Or we have this thing in there. I think I can show this one. So for example, uh, again, screen resolution, sorry, I was planning for a bigger screen. Uh, so you have one photo and you have another photo, and if you have Photoshop, you have that, so you want to say, I want this photo to have the colors of that photo. So you want your crappy holiday picture to look like um, Technicolor 60s style or so. So there's a thing called color transfer, and what it does, it looks like this little snippet down here, of course, you imagine there's the rest. If you map every color pixel in this photo to a 3D space, every picture has something like a cloud. And uh, I hope I know my buttons here. Was it this one? No. Uh, okay, well, you can see there's the Mona Lisa. The, so, okay, this girl, this, so this photo uh, down here, the cloud looks like this. And this photo, the cloud looks like that. And what color transfer does is it takes the one cloud and squeezes it and rotates it in this way that it has somehow the same space and orientation as the other one. And I hope I find my right buttons, but uh, which do one do I have to press? Ah, there are actually these buttons. So what you do is you do something like uh, you find the the eigenvalues or the eigenvectors of this cloud, which are somehow, yeah, they, they tell you about the orientation and size of that cloud. And then you, what you do is actually you rotate those two together. So now you can see the, the right cloud and the left cloud are somehow tr getting the same shape. And down here, uh, yellowish, yellowish. Let's use another photo here. Where is it? Um, or here? Where am I? Ah. Yeah. And here. And this one. And this. And okay, so, so you see, and it's always like this black and white image has a very thin cloud. And now the Mona Lisa uses the same kind of appearance. So yeah, and that's what I'm doing. Like ideally, that's what I'm doing all the time. But since we are a small startup, I actually have also to do boring stuff. So it's, it's not all happy. But yeah, so I'm uh, just f trying to find new things. That's what I'm doing and uh, enjoying myself. <laughs> 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 Thank you.